Well, a very good morning to you. Welcome to church this morning, a particularly warm welcome. If this is your first time with us this morning, it's great to see you. It's great to have you with us today. I wonder how this past week has been for you. Well, how reassuring it is that despite the ups and the downs of life, God does not change. We're going to sing the great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. The words of this hymn were uh, written just over 100 years ago, but the words that inspired it from Lamentations have been around for much, much longer. Lamentations 2, verses 22 and 23 say, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How has uh, the past week, how has this day so far felt for you? God doesn't change. His mercies are new. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Let's stand to think of that now.
Father God, great is thy faithfulness. We want to thank and praise you for your faithfulness to us. Amen. Do please sit down. We are beginning a new sermon series this morning on the Holy Spirit. Jonathan will begin that and introduce that as he preaches to us a bit later. In the first verse from the passage that we'll be studying this morning, Jesus says to followers of him, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. True love for Jesus means obedience to him. So those words motivate us to live and keep living for Jesus, but they're also, well, deeply challenging, aren't they? Because as believers, we, we do love Jesus, but don't we often fail to do what he commands? As we pray our confession prayer together, let's bring to God all the ways that his Spirit is prompting us to admit that we fail to live the way that Jesus wants us to. So together, let's pray, beginning with the words, Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, for our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Also in our passage this morning, Jesus goes on to say that his Spirit dwells within us and lives in us. If we trust him, Jesus has forgiven us all of our sin, and he is transforming us. He is ridding us of sin, making us more like him through his Spirit. He dwells within us. So as our next song puts it, he is our help, our help to grow in holiness. Let's stand to sing. Your spirit, so we never be alone. 
Now is the time for those in reception to year nine to head off to their groups. If you're visiting, you're very welcome to join us uh, at those this morning. Some at the front will show you where to go. And for the rest of us, uh, do sit down. Yes. Thank you to the loyal people still standing. Um, for the rest of us, let us uh, use this as an opportunity to chat uh, to those that we're sitting amongst and maybe introduce ourselves to those who we don't know and haven't met before. I know that was an inadequate amount of time, but please do draw your conversations to a close for now and be sure to uh, pick those up and continue them uh, later on after uh, the service. We're going to declare together what we believe by saying the Nicene Creed together. So because you love stage directions, please would you stand. We say these words together, beginning, we believe. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate, a Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Do please sit down. Well, in communion services like this, we like to support one of our uh, mission partners, and in April we're supporting the ministry of Andy and May Ling Wilson. Until 2016, Andy and May Ling were involved in church planting in Taiwan. Since then, 
They have been engaged in evangelism, discipleship, leadership, training, and um, and something else there, I forgot what I was going to say. Lots of other things uh, with students and um, overseas students and visitors from East Asia. We'll have the opportunity to pray for them a little bit later on in the service and also to support them financially. But for now, here's Andy to read to us. Good morning. The Bible reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and verses 15 to 20. And it's, I believe, on page 901 of the Pew Bibles. The words of Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. Good morning, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you know that we're hard-pressed in all kinds of ways. Thank you that you speak to us in your living word to encourage us. Give us your Holy Spirit, we pray, so that we might understand, believe, and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. So as Matt has said, this morning we're beginning a new series on the Holy Spirit and on what Jesus taught about the Spirit before he went to his death. So if you have questions about the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does, then our prayer is that this series will help. Today our focus is on those verses that Andy's just read for us, John 14, 15 to 20, But I want to jump ahead a bit uh, to begin with and um, look at what happened to the apostles after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So first of all, the apostles experienced Jesus with them by the Holy Spirit. They had seen Jesus die. They had been astonished and overjoyed to see Jesus raised from the dead. But his presence with them, even after the resurrection, had been intermittent at best. They knew he was alive. But most of the time, they did not know where he was. And then they'd seen him ascend to heaven, hidden from their sight by a cloud. Once more, they were alone. But though Jesus was gone, he had made promises Jesus told them that they would receive power to tell the world all about him. He told them that the Holy Spirit would come to them. And what is more, he told them that he, Jesus, would be with them forever. Now, no doubt they did not understand how Jesus could at the same time be with them and also leave them. They waited, they prayed And the Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit descended on those first frightened disciples on the day of Pentecost, they knew that they were not alone any longer. Their fear was overwhelmed by the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. And then they knew that they had work to do. There was a whole world that needed to know that Jesus was the crucified and risen Lord and Saviour. They knew that though they could not see him, Jesus was with them. The pieces of this puzzling jigsaw fitted into place. All the things that Jesus had been saying, which they had found so mystifying, began to make sense. Of course they longed for the return of Jesus, but never again is there any sense that they are battling along without him. 
Instead, as you read the book of Acts, there's an amazing sense of the fellowship with Jesus that the disciples enjoyed through their experience of the Holy Spirit. So the Apostle John says at the start of his first letter, chapter 1, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And he's not just remembering those three years of walking and talking with Jesus, nor is he only looking forward to the day when he will see Jesus face to face once more. He is experiencing fellowship with Jesus, even as he writes. That is what the Holy Spirit does, because he is God. Not just a force or a power, not a thing, not it, but he. The third person of the Trinity, as we've just been saying in the Nicene Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, he is God, that is to say, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. There's the Trinity. And the Spirit brings people into fellowship with Jesus. And you don't have to be an apostle. John writes, he says, so that we might also share in this fellowship with Jesus. He wants every Christian to experience Jesus in the very same way that he did. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to give us that experience of knowing Jesus. And unless we understand that central role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are likely to lay ourselves open to any number of misunderstandings about the work of the Spirit which could cause us and others confusion and heartache. That's why it's so important for us to listen hard to what Jesus himself says about the work of the Spirit. This was one of the major themes of his final briefing to the disciples on that night before he was betrayed. So we're into the last few hours of his earthly life with them. What does he say? We're going to be looking at different aspects of that over the coming weeks. We hope to build up a comprehensive picture. So keep coming. But for a start, look at those verses in John 14, verses 15 to 20 on page 901. And that brings me to my second heading. So secondly, Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit. Here are those verses again. John 14, 15 to 20. Jesus says to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And again a bit later on in 16.7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now what's going on in the minds of the disciples at this time? They know that they need Jesus with them. They know that Jesus is going. And their whole horizon is filled with what they see as a personal disaster for them. They cannot see past 
their emotions, and their emotions are fear and grief. Fear and grief swamp any possibility that they'll begin to see the greater long-term purpose behind Jesus' departure. Chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus says to them, Let not your hearts be troubled. Why does Jesus say that? Because their hearts are troubled. Chapter 16, verse 6, but because Jesus said to them, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And that's understandable, but nonetheless it's a profoundly mistaken reaction. Their troubled hearts and their grief demonstrate a severe lack of understanding of what Jesus is doing. And I do not say that as a criticism from a position of superiority. We too can find ourselves swamped by fear and grief at times when we just don't understand what God is up to in our lives. Sometimes we're in the thick of troubles And we resolutely refuse to look past them to the promises and the purposes of Christ. Instead, we cry out, where have you gone? Things should not be like this. So the disciples' reaction is understandable to us. After all, what does Jesus warn them of? Chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 15, verse 20. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. 16, verse 2. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Sounds like a great prospect. But for all that, fear and grief is still absolutely the wrong reaction. Why? Because they're not losing Jesus. A mother who is giving birth to a baby certainly feels pain, but she should not feel grief. She's not losing the baby as it leaves her body. Far from it. So Jesus says in chapter 16, verse 21, when a woman is giving birth, She has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she she no longer remembers the anguish or joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you. The disciples think they're losing Jesus. Nothing could be further from the truth, but they're only half hearing what Jesus is saying. Chapter 14 Verses 16 to 18, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is returning to the one who sent him. He's on a mission, it's not yet complete. It's a matter of life and death for the disciples that he does complete it. His departure is an integral part of his mission. Unless he goes, the mission fails, but he has no intention of failing. And when he does go, he will send the Holy Spirit who will come to them. If he was to stay, they would not have the Holy Spirit, the helper, the counselor with them. They want to cling on to Jesus, but what they really need to do is let him go. Chapter 14, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. The gift of the Spirit cannot and must not be separated from all that is involved in the departure of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Moses struck the rock in the wilderness and water gushed out. In the same way, the outpouring of the Spirit flows from the cross. The two belong together. There is no real Christian life without the cross and resurrection. There is no real Christian life without the gift of the Holy Spirit. We try to have Jesus without the Spirit 
we end up with dead orthodoxy and faith without love, which is not real faith at all. Even the devil believes in Jesus. If we try to have the Holy Spirit without the cross and the resurrection, then we end up with Christless Christianity, gospel-free faith, groundless spirituality, and the exaltation of experiences which have no connection to Christ and his saving work. But when Jesus gives the Spirit, then we have a living relationship with Christ. We have power to persevere in bearing witness to the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. The departure of Jesus brings the arrival of the Holy Spirit. What God has joined together, let not man separate. And when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus is with us. So the wonderful truth is that the Holy Spirit enables us to know Jesus just as the apostles knew the risen Jesus. We are not at a disadvantage. Jesus has not left us alone. He is with us by his Spirit, drawing us into fellowship with himself. So when we feel the attraction of the person of Jesus and he begins to fill our horizon, then that is the Holy Spirit at work within us. When we experience fellowship with Jesus and we know that he is with us, though we can't see him, that is the Holy Spirit at work within us. He gives us that deep down security that comes from knowing that we are sons and daughters of God because we've been adopted into the family through the death of Jesus for us. He gives us the strong lifetime purpose that comes from serving Jesus. He gives us the supreme experience of friendship with Jesus. Maybe that will lead to moments of overwhelming joy. Certainly it brings the joy of deep-rooted, eternally satisfying friendship with the one who promised to be with us to the end of time and who fulfilled that promise through the gift of the Spirit. What happens when the Holy Spirit comes? Jesus is with us. We experience his living presence. We have fellowship with him and with the Father. So, thirdly, be filled with the Spirit. The Apostle Paul urges us in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. How can we be filled with the Spirit? The most straightforward answer to that is this. Ask God to fill you. Ask God to give you his spirit. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to experience fellowship with him, then ask for the Holy Spirit. And you can guarantee that every genuine request like that is granted by God. How can I say that? Because we have Jesus' word for it. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Six times over, the promise is given, just in case we miss the point. And how can we be sure that that applies to the gift of the Holy Spirit? Jesus immediately says so. Luke 11, verses 11 to 13. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will, give a, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit... To those who ask him. In other words, of course God will give you the Holy Spirit if you ask to receive him. That is just the request that God is longing to hear from us. The Holy Spirit brings with him power for witness. 
gifts for building up the body of Christ, the church. Fruit that leaves less and less room for sin in our lives. But above all, the Holy Spirit brings us into fellowship with Jesus. Is that what we want? Is that what you want? Do we want Jesus to be with us always? Do we want the fear to be driven out of our lives? If we want those things, then we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do, so do we want to be filled with the Spirit? Then we should ask and ask again and keep on asking. And when we do, he comes to us and makes his home with us. That is the promise of Jesus. He dwells with you and will be in you. I will come to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that through Jesus and by your Holy Spirit, you are with us, among us, and in us, as we trust in you, strengthen our joy in this wonderful truth. Help us to remember it when we're struggling. Fill us and keep on filling us, we pray, with your Holy Spirit, that our lives might bear witness to Jesus and bring glory to your name. Amen. I love the chorus of this next song. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Let's make that our prayer as we sing. Please stand.
risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We're going to pray, and Ashok Bandela is going to lead us. Do please be seated. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let us pray. Heavenly loving Father, we thank you and praise you for being our refuge strength, and ever-present help in times of trouble. My Lord, I thank you for speaking to us today from your word, that without your Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. You are the source of all power, and we thank you and praise you for giving us this unlimited source of power to all who ask him and go on asking him. Father, we bring people of Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia to your mercy throne. Please bring the war and suffering to an end. Raise the peacemakers in those two nations. Raise the world leaders to intervene and bring these two warring nations for talks and stop this inhuman war. Father, our nation has drifted away from respecting your word and its values. Please open the eyes of our nation to see the truth. Repent and turn to you to receive the blessings. Bring the ever needed revival in our nation. Father, you made us in your own image male and female you made to bring glory and honor to your name. Please deliver our nation from the confusion around this important issue of life and to respect the truth in your word and value it. Dear Father, please protect young people from loneliness and addictions and give them hope at the time of despair. Father, I particularly pray for those who are baptized and confirmed recently. You bless them, protect them, strengthen them, and may your light shine through them, and may your name be glorified through them. Father, please give comfort to them that lost their loved ones recently. We also remember the jobless. Please do provide them with jobs. We remember sick among us. Please restore them to good health. Father, please give all the JPC ministers a vision to lead our church only by your word and through your spirit. Bless all our church programs and our mission pastor, our partners and our home groups. I pray particularly, I pray that you bless Andy and uh, Mailing their work among East Asians as they take Christ to them and give them wisdom and strength to support and help the students and family, families who need Christ. Now in a moment of silence, we bring all our personal concerns and cares to your throne of grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers through Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ashok, very much. 
This is a service of Holy Communion. Let me explain how this will work. When the time comes, the sidesman will show you out of your pew to come to the front rail up behind me uh, and to the choir stalls on either side to receive the bread and the wine. If you're in one of the galleries today, then do please come down. A steward will show you when. If you'd rather not drink wine from the common cup, as is the custom, then as you come forward, you'll pass a basket uh, on the uh, stand on the step with little individual containers of wine. Just take one of those, bring it up to the rail uh, with you in your hand, and then when the cup is brought round after the bread, open your individual container and drink from that instead. And there'll be somebody up here uh, to show you where to go. There'll also be a receptacle for your used container as you follow around and back towards your place. Let me also say uh, that the Bible says we should examine ourselves before we receive the bread and the wine. That is, we should ask ourselves if we are trusting in the death of Jesus for our forgiveness and whether we are treating others rightly in the light of that. We welcome to receive the bread and the wine, all who are right with God and with one another through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are one of those here still thinking through the Christian faith, then you're very welcome uh, and simply remain in your seat when the time comes. So as we come to the Lord's table, we pray together. We do not presume. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in your tender mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of the death that he suffered, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. So draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving.
So together we pray, Almighty God. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, we bring our thanks today. That's our prayer in this final hymn. Please stand. sit down. Well again, can I say thank you so much for being with us this morning. Please do stay for some refreshments after the service, and because of the blustery conditions, we'll have those inside. So Liz Jackson cares about everyone's hairdos. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, outside in future weeks, weather permitting. And please do stay with us if you're new with us uh, this morning. We'd love to tell you more about what's happening in the life of the church here, including our small groups. Please do ask if you'd like to be in one of those. They're great ways to belong and to get to know others. Do join us this evening for our 6.30 p.m. service. We begin a new series in the book of 2 Samuel, which foreshadows King Jesus and his kingdom and shows us how good and how necessary Jesus is. 
On Saturday coming, we'll have a night of prayer, a uh, night of praise, sorry, here in church with songs, prayer, and scripture. Do come along to praise God, praise God for his greatness. That's on Saturday coming, the 13th of April, from 8 to 9, 15 p.m. here in church, and everyone is very welcome at that. There's more information on our weekly email about a whole range of things happening across the life of the church here, including the CAP Money course that begins on the 30th of April, and also that link to give financially to support Andy and Mei Ling and their great and important ministry. If you do not get that weekly email, but you'd like to get it, please let someone know, and we'll be sure to get you signed up to that. And finally, a notice about our electoral role. We are a Church of England parish church, and we have an electoral role. This is an official list of those who can vote at the annual church meeting and stand for election to the PCC. That electoral role is being revised ahead of our annual parochial church meeting on Sunday, the 12th of May. If you'd like to join and you're eligible, please do so by returning the online form in the weekly email or by using the forms at the welcome desk. We need to receive those by Wednesday, the 24th of April. To end our service, let's pray. Almighty God, who taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant by the same Spirit we may judge everything rightly and always rejoice in his holy protection through the merits of Christ Jesus our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So JPC, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.